Hey everybody, I'm Bill Calkins with Ball Tech On Demand and we're back with another installment of In The Break Room, an entire month of short educational sessions intended to help you get prepared to grow your best crops ever to send to market this year. Fall's a critical period. I like to call it spring training for the greenhouse industry. It's when we get our operations tuned up for high-end production and we've picked nine topics to cover this month, one for each Tuesday and Thursday. Hopefully you've already heard one or two and you're taking some time each day to grab your phone or your tablet, laptop, and head to the break room, grab a bite to eat, and get ready for some information. Today's topic is one that's not been covered a lot in video. It's been covered a lot in research articles and in trade journals, but I haven't found too many videos on this subject, but it is definitely an important topic for all growers. And our guest expert today is no stranger to videos and podcasts because he's an expert who's got a passion for sharing information. It's Dr. Will Healy, the Senior Technical Manager at Ball, who's gonna take us through the importance of understanding photo period when growing key crops. Real quick, before Will gets started, all the videos and webinars from this series will be collected and posted at growertalks.com slash tech on demand for future viewing or to share with the rest of your team. The link to this series, as well as some of the information that Will's gonna to cover today is gonna to be in the video description. So since time is short and this information is not, let's get going. Will, why don't you share your screen and take it away? Well, thanks a lot, Bill, for um, the kind introduction and calling me an expert. That must mean I'm at, my, at least 500 miles away from whoever's listening <clears throat> because that's what defines an expert. But let's talk about probably one of the most powerful tools in the toolbox for growers, especially growers who are trying to do precision growing and hitting very specific dates. You know, we use temperature, we can use growth regulators to make them the right size, but really photo period is the single tool that we can use. But you know, Bill, as you and I have talked over the last couple of weeks as we were preparing this, it's confusing because this is the third iteration that Bill basically has said, no, Will, that doesn't make sense. That really doesn't capture what do I need to do as a grower to be successful. So hopefully this is going to be um, helpful. And we're, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about a number of different tools and ways we can use photo period to really change the appearance and timing of the crops that we have. So let's get started because, you know, Bill, you don't give me much time to do this. So as we get started here, um, let's go ahead and um, take a look at our um, first slide, which is the... Um, <clears throat> the photo period terminology, because this is kind of where it, all of a sudden the confusion begins. When we're talking about photo period, we're really talking about how flowering responds. So when we talk about um, long days, short days, um, day neutral, that basically tell is a clue as to when we use those um, long days, short days, um, that's what will trigger plants into flower. But because plants are like people, sometimes they're just not very cooperative. There's a whole group of plants called day neutral plants. Sometimes you'll see it as DNP. Basically what they are is they don't respond to photo period at all. They're non-responsive. They usually have a different trigger that basically promotes flowering. And we're gonna talk about those in a second. But let's first of all talk about long day plants. And why this is confusing to most people is that when they came up with the terminology back in the 1920s, you know, just before Bill was born, um, they basically had um, said that this is a long day, but what's really critical is the night length. Long days have short nights. The graphic that I'm using basically shows what happens when if you use a 13 hour dark period, basically on a long day plant, that is a vegetatively grown plant. The plants are vegetative. If on the other hand, you reduce the dark period to 11 hours, which of course gives you a 13 hour day. So the day length is 13 hours, it's long. That plant will be initiated to flower. So when we talk about long day plants, we're talking about how long the day is, but just to confuse it, we're really concerned about how long the night is. Um, and as you get further into this, you'll understand why that's important. Conversely, there's short day plants. These are plants that flower when the, um, the days are short. So for example, when you have an 11 hour day and a 13 hour night, then that plant will initiate flowers. 
Conversely, if you have a 13 hour day and an 11 hour night, the plants will be vegetative. And I think most people really understand that if they've grown poinsettias or chrysanthemums, those are classic short day plants. But there's a lot of plants in our assortment which are technically um, long day plants. In fact, if you think about it, everything we sell in the spring and the summer, when the days are long, these are long day plants. So we really need to keep that in mind if we're trying to get really early days. Simplify this, a long day plant is vegetative when the days are less than 11 hours and they flower when the days are longer than 13 hours. Well, what about 12 hours? Well, there's, it's kind of one of those, as it kind of moves right around 12 hours is when things happen, but the most profound change in growth from vegetative to flowering occurs when that day length is um, less than 11 vegetative um, and greater than 13 is flowering. That's the long day plant. 13, a uh, short day plant really is right around 12 hours. So vegetative growth, anytime it's more than 12 hours and flower initiation, any less than, um, than 12 hours um, will give you a flowering response. So a lot of confusing information, but we've got some great tables um, that we'll share with you at the end where they're located. It'll be in the title of the, um, of the video where you can find these, but there's categorized a lot of the plant material that we have um, for bedding plants and also for perennials into whether they're day neutral, whether they're a long day plant or a short day plant. Now, sometimes you see a, a terminology, I'll just throw it out there, facultative, obligatory. Um, what that means is facultative is they will flower faster under long days, but eventually they're gonna flower. Um, obligatory means that they absolutely have to have that period, that photo period to flower. So if they're not absolutely long, they're, they will not flower. The same with um, short days, there's um, facultative and um, obligatory. So let's talk about um, one of our most common plants that are day neutral. And basically what its flowering mechanism is, is that it's juvenile meaning that it initiates a certain number of nodes and then it just starts flowering and will continue to flower. Probably the classic is impatience, both Wallerana, um, the normal garden impatience, New Guinea, some patients. Um, the juvenile phase is about five to seven nodes um, in New Guinea's. If you grew them from seed, they have about seven to nine, somewhere sometimes 11 nodes. Um, and basically those basal nodes, the ones right down there by the soil, those are vegetative. They send out the, the branches and that's how you get a bushy plant is by those growing vegetatively. But then all the nodes after that continue to throw flowers. It's a lateral inflorescence. So the, the growing point keeps getting longer, throwing flowers um, pretty continuously. If we take a look at a different system, and this is a light accumulator, probably the, the best example of a day neutral plant that's a light accumulator is of course geraniums. Zonals, ivies, interspecific, anyone that's still growing seed geraniums knows that seed geraniums are specifically um, require a certain amount of high intensity light to flower. If you don't give the light, they just don't flower. And that's the same thing with um, the zonal geraniums. Um, the ve they're vegetatively propagated, so they tend to have flowers with them, but the more light, the more flowers that you end up with. Let's talk about um, some of the perennials, because the perennials are probably one of our biggest challenge because they have a combination of a juvenility and they are cold, have a cold requirement and then they can flower. And the cold requirement is called vernalization. You know, if we look at one of the um, poster childs is Aquilegia. There's some beautiful Aquilegia out there. And they basically, you have to grow them in a juvenile stage. And this is why a lot of your perennials are planted in the fall so that they can develop that juvenile, their bulking is one of the terminologies to develop enough leaves. And then they're given a cold treatment of anywhere between four to six weeks. And then they're put under um, basically day neutral conditions, warm them back up and off they go and they flower. So knowing how you trigger the flowering of day neutral plants is really important. And that's in that, um, especially in the perennials, there is a sheet that basically covers a lot of the perennials. So day neutral, Bottom line is there's something else other than photo period that causes it. Because one of the things you can do when you're confused about how do I get my plants to flower is remember, you can take the plant out of its native country, 
but you can't take the country out of the plan. So if this is a plan that basically um, evolved in the um, tropics where the photoperiod is 12 hours, guess what? They're not photoperiodic. Or if they're, they're where it's always very cold, they probably have a vernalization requirement. Whereas if the plants are grown where there's an oscillation of photoperiod, you know, kind of where we are through North America and through Europe where there's short and long days during the year, they're probably photoperiodic. So, you know, you can, if you're not sure and you can't find a table that tells you how to, that plant is induced to flower, go find out where it comes from, look at the latitude, and that'll give you a good uh, clue as to whether it's a long day or a short day plant, depending upon when it naturally flowers. But keep that in mind because that's what we use to determine what kind of photoperiod is required. Now let's, let's change gears a little bit. Let's go talk about a facultative long day plant, which we all know and love, which are petunias. Um, Facultative long day plant um, is this is the model that was first done back in the 1940s, showing a lot of the phenomena that we're going to talk about. And it's really important to understand these because you kind of wonder sometimes, but I but I put lights on them and nothing happened. Or I they they're just flowering even, even though I did nothing. Remember, once you've induced a petunia, they're going to continue to flower indefinitely if there's a minimum light intensity. It's more common in the seedling that there is a juvenility phase. Vegetative plants don't have a juvenile phase because basically they're um, already mature and they're flowering. So as long as they haven't cycled them through a short day, they're basically gonna throw flowers um, as long as the um, days are modestly long and the light intensity is there. But let's just talk about seedling um, juvenility. Um, what it means when it's a facultative long day plant, I did research a number of years ago on petunias, and basically after they unfolded 23 leaves, they will have a flower regardless of photo period. But if you put them under long days, they will initiate flowers at, under 11 nodes, so they'll flower much faster. So if you have, um, basically you look at a petunia, about 15 to 20 days after ger the seed has germinated is when they're first responsive to the um, photo period. And why is that? It's because they have to unfold that and develop that many leaves and it takes about 15 to 20 days to basically get that leaf count on the plant, which is they've unfold about, um, you know, they initiate oh somewhere around seven to 11 nodes and then bam, they're basically are ready to be initiated if you have them under long days. So when you're growing multiflora, grandiflora, what stage is that? It's usually about when there's two leaves unfolded. Wave, they're a little bit different in their breeding, and so therefore they require about five to seven leaves have to unfold. And a leaf unfolding is, if you count the leaf that's straight up, that's the first leaf you count, and then you count them all the way down, but you don't count the cotyledons. So once you've got five to seven leaves on a wave, it can be induced. Lighting before that has no difference. Lighting after that just causes a further delay in flowering. So that's when you really want to hit them at the first time. So when do I um, do the waves? Well, actually, there's um, different critical photo periods, the minimum day length required. And there's a table in this, in this chart. There's also tables on the Pan Am website for wave petunias telling you, are you in group one, two, three, or four? And that this is the minimum day length, so how long the day has to be to basically trigger flower in initiation. Some of you have basically challenged with Easy Wave Pink. Easy Wave Pink is basically one of those plants that do require um, a minimum um, photo period um, day length of a, at least 11 hours to initiate, um, whereas the um, some of the other um, varieties basically initiate as soon as the day length gets down to um, 11 hours. So um, basically think about your earliest flowering are those that where the day length is 10 hours, and those are the ones that flower the most rapidly, because Usually you've got 10 hours across most of North America. Um, sometime by the time you're in February, you're gonna be initiated, but then you still have to unfold the leaves. And so the question is, is how do I time my, my waves? Well, um, you can time your waves and there's a tool that we'll see in a minute, but keep in mind that for floral initiation on long day plants, if the temperatures are in the range of 65 to 75 degrees, you can very easily induce these to flower. A lot of times photo periods are sensitive within a very tight window of, of temperature. 
65 to 75 degree night temperatures. If the night temperatures are less than 65 degrees, they basically are not photoperiodic. If the temperatures are over 75, you basically start to delay um, induction. So you really need to have those temperatures um, dialed in. So not too hot, not too cold, but just right for best initiation. Um, I just mentioned um, something we've done many years ago, which is how you do a fast crop. And how you do this fast crop is um, with seed raised is you use a 288 plug so that you have a little bit more space to grow the plant. And you basically grow them under long days. Once they have about two leaves unfolded, this is best to do with multiflora or grandiflora, more difficult with waves. And then you basically put them on a 14 day fast finish when you transplant them and you keep them warm in that um, 65, 75 degree night temperature and you can get very rapid development because they're all induced in, this, uh, in the plug and then they basically just have to be turned out and flowering. So I mentioned this Wave Smart Scheduler which is in the um, Pan Am website and basically it will um, give you different temperatures that you're going to be forcing at, and then how fast, how many days to flower. And then you can see on this chart that there is a range of um, speed of flowering. You know, if you take a look at um, Easy Wave White under 68 degrees night temperatures, it um, once it's um, induced, you can flower in 39 days. Whereas if you take um, wave purple improve, um, it can basically take, or classic, it takes 49 days, so it takes 10 days longer, and it's just because of the genetics. Um, in the wave, they're working to get earlier and earlier flowering, and of course, seed, drain, seed petunias, they bred a lot of the photoperiod sensitivity out of them, so they're much easier to flower. So hopefully, you understand facultative long day plants, petunias are the classic, critical temperature, it get in the zone, get the plants up to size, induce them to flower. Usually you can um, induce them with about a week of long days. And then at that point they're induced and then transplanting them and then just giving them enough light that they'll just flower right straight through. Let's quickly move on to some other plants. Um, Calibrachoa. This is a fairly new set of genetics compared to petunias where they've had a lot of generations of breeding to remove some of the photoperiod um, sensitivity. Calibrachoa are still somewhat um, variable in their variety response and sensitivity to photoperiod. The critical photoperiod is definitely correlated with temperature so that you need to make sure you're in the right temperature, that 65, 75 degree night temperature for them to be responsive to long days. They take about less than seven long day cycles to trigger flowering in some varieties. Some varieties need upwards to 14 days, but most of them will, will flower with at least um, a week worth of long days. So if you don't have long days everywhere, at least expose your young plants, the liners, to long days for about seven days to make sure that they're fully induced before you move them into a final forcing conditions where the days are just naturally um, not necessarily long. Um, be careful that if the photo period drops below 12 hours, they will revert to vegetative condition. And then you're gonna to have to cycle through that vegetative leaf um, leaves that have, until you can re-induce them. So make sure that when you get unrooted cuttings of calibacoa, that you've got them under long days so that they don't revert to short days, especially during when you're rooting in December, January, and February. By March 15th, you're starting to get about 12 hour photo period. And so you're kind of home free. Remember, Florel acts like a short day. It aborts the flower. It stops flowering so that you have to restart them. There's classic pictures where you have the center of your plants are just all green. They don't have flowers in them, and it's because you've stopped them either through short days or Florel. Be very careful about that. Night temperatures greater than 62. I'd like to have 65 degree night temperatures and photo periods greater than 12 hours give you the best flowering response. Manage the temperatures in flowering to synchronize um, that flowering. So really watch what you're doing. Let's talk about pansy violas because it's that time of year when um, the days are getting shorter and pansy violas are long day plants. So that when you have a short day of less than 12 hours, it delays induction. Now that's a really beneficial thing during the fall or during the summer production when the days are very long and the, the very warm night temperatures when you basically start struggling with getting a stick in a pot where they induce too fast and you don't get that good basal branching to fill out the plants. In that case, what we do is we reduce the light intensity to basically 
trick them into believing they're under somewhat of a short day conditions, even though we're not pulling short days. And that basically what that does is it, in, it delays flowering so that we end up with good basal branching and a full plant. So if you struggle with um, stick in a pot syndrome, basically in the fall pansies, maybe you should be putting a little short days on them or reduce light intensity to get them to bulk. On the other hand, if you're, they're flowering delayed, you may want to go and look at putting some long days on the plugs to induce them so that they will flower a little bit faster. Let's talk about snapdragons. Probably this is probably one of the most common questions we get. Why are my snaps flowering so late? I plant them sequentially, but they're not. These are long day plants. The snapshot series is a good example of a summer flowering group three, four snapdragons that flowers under warm nights and long days. So if you grow snapshot, you must put some long days on them and keep them warm in the plug stage so that you can induce them to flower. So then when you transplant them, they flower right straight through, even though you're turning them back down and grew, grew them nice and cool. If you don't want to um, light them, for early spring flowering, you want to use a, a variety called Solstice, a series Solstice. It's a group one snapdragon. And this group one snapdragon basically is induced under cool nights and short days. So you need to make sure that you've got the right series and the right environmental conditions. So although this is, gets to be a little confusing, but these are some of the photo period tricks that you can use to induce optimum flowering. Invariably, every year we get questions about pot asters. Again, this is one of those that's classified as long days for initiation. But if you grow continuously under long days, it slows its development. Conversely, um, what you want to do is you want to grow them under long days and then under short, short days for flower development so you get rapid uniform flowering. So if you go and you plant these in the northern hemisphere, grow them under long days, and then you transplant them in April, well, or even in the middle of March, basically what's happening is, is you're growing them under long days, inducing them, and then you're finishing them under um, <clears throat> the long days of the natural long days that are starting to increase as you go from March, April, and May. So you really want to be very careful when you're doing pot asters that you do these early so that they have long days to initiate them and then they have the natural short days of February and March to get rapid development and that then you can grow them cool and flower them out. So be careful when you're actually growing them if you're trying to do this naturally, otherwise you're not. Make sure that you have at least 21 days after sowing is when they're sensitive to flower induction in the plug stage and they're interesting, very, very sensitive to um, light conditions. Probably the other um, interesting plant is the begonia tuberous begonia, the nonstop type begonias, and dahlias. Although they are not technically long day plants for induction of flowering, but the tuber, which basically throws them into a resting stage, which then leads to stopping flower, is responsive to short days. So if you want to keep the tubers from forming, so you want to prevent tuber forming, you basically grow them under long days, greater than 12 hours. And what that does is it just prevents tuber formation and prevents them from going dormant. How many times have you seen begonia tuberous hy tuber hybrid that you buy them in early, you get them in in February, and you plant them under naturally short days, and they just don't really flower until you start getting out to May, June. The problem there is they formed a tuber, and you actually can feel it form down underneath the soil. Once that tuber forms, the lighting is too late. You've got to keep um, begonias and dahlias under day lights from the time you receive them right straight through. Let's change gears real quickly and let's talk about short day plants. Specifically, let's talk about chrysanthemums. Um, everyone knows chrysanthemums are a short day plant. And what we know about this is the short day plants have different response groups. So there is a um, garden mums are the shortest response groups, but you know, what is a response group? That's the time from the induction until you have open flowers. This is that window of how long does it take to get them to bloom. So garden mums are classified five to seven week, pot mums eight to 10 weeks. Um, I'm sorry, that should say um, cut mums, not garden mums. Cut mums are 11 plus weeks. Um, floral initiation, 
um, less than 13 hours for a 10 week response group. Um, and then you basically have a little bit of play time. Um, they'll respond if you get a garden mum, they'll initiate under a little bit, um, like about 11 hour um, <clears throat> photo period, day length. So you, it does change a little bit depending upon which response groups. The key take home message is it takes 14 to 28 short days to get induction completed. So people want to know how long do I need to pull the short day clock? Well, you have to do it a minimum of 14 days. Better yet, go out to four weeks, 28 days to get the maximum benefit of that short day. After that, they're induced. They'll basically, you can do it. If you go and you pull, basically, you're growing them um, in the summer, the garden mums, and you only give them 14 days, and you pull it too early, you might basically end up with um, crown buds forming, and that, of course, we all know is bad. One of the interesting things about chrysanthemums, and you see this in a number of short day plants, is that they're very sensitive to temperatures less than 65 degrees. They're basically less than 65 degrees, they initiate flowers. This is why when we have this cool night snap, temperature snap in July, the last week in July, um, basically you end up with early flowering mini mums. Whereas if it's hot during the last week in July, basically it delays initiation until we get to August when the days are definitely short, and then you get big mums. And if you get a lot of hot weather in the end of July and first part of August, you end up with monster mums that are really delayed. So really that critical temp night temperature is, um, which triggers less than 65 degrees, you promote flowering regardless of photo period. And if the night temperatures are greater than 80 degrees, um, that you inhibit flowering. So that's why when you're using black cloth, it's important that you open it up in the middle of the night after the sun is set to relieve that temperature so that you don't cook them underneath the plastic or you better yet use a bilayer where there's white on the top of the plastic and black on the underside so that it reflects the heat and it doesn't build up heat underneath the black cloth. So night temperatures are very important because you can delay initiation. Remember, once the plants have induced, you can continue development under long days. You know, poinsettias, we're uh, going through that right now. The response, there are different response groups. They're not as defined as in um, chrysanthemums. They're basically early flowering, mid-season and late. Um, <clears throat> then that's really of when they are responsive to the photo period and how long it takes for those bracts to develop. Floral initiation occurs when the day length is less than 10 hours. Um, but remember, if you have increased temperatures um, and or decreased day length, it can change the actual day of initiation. So we kind of have this broad period of time when initiation is, um, and they're very sensitive to light, so we really need to make sure that we don't have any stray light in there. 16 to 25 short days are required to complete induction. So if you're pulling black cloth, basically you run it out about 25 days, and then you can stop pulling black cloth, and they should just continue developing right straight through. Remember, just like in chrysanthemum, night temperatures above 80 degrees do inhibit flower initiation. Now, I want to mention just an interesting um, plant that, um, because zinnias, because zinnias, you know, they pretty free flowering, but a lot of times people call and complain, my flowers aren't double, and this is on the elegance. <clears throat> Flower initiation and there's florets. These are the actual petals. Notice in the picture we have the ray florets. These are the petals. And the disc florets, notice that's that center that has no petals. It's just, um, these are two different types. They're male and female flowers. Um, if you have less than 10 um, hours um, and you have five short day cycles, that's enough to induce them. Um, if you have more than 12 hours, you basically end up with petals um, versus um, the disc florets. So if you take a look at when, if you've been watching your um, plants as you've gone through the season and you see at this, at, during this early spring, you have lots of petals and then you basically start going to the middle of the summer. You've got all of these disc florets showing up and the petals, they're not as nice, like a little ratty looking. And then all of a sudden we get into the fall and they look good again. And that's just because there's differentiation of the flower type on a composite, depending upon if you're in um, long or short days. Another plant that we have a lot of problems getting is this cosmos. People say, I need to keep these smaller. How do I do this? Well, it's very important that you give them a good 
short day, anything less than 14 hours. So if you can get them even less than 12 hour day, um, the, you're basically going to be able to get them into um, flour and they will be shorter. And you have to do that from the very beginning, right after they un the cotyledons unfold, you need to get them under short days to basically induce them as fast as possible. And as this picture clearly shows, growing them from seedling stage in short days, you end up with a short, compact plant that basically is flowering vigorously. But if you had it under a night interruption, which is a long day, um, basically they're tall and um, weedy. So once they start flowering, they're good to go, but you gotta get them flowered. Let's talk about another confusing one because this is very typical of what we see. You need to understand what species your plant is as to whether they're a long day or are they a short day. When we take celosia, there's two different types of celosia, two different species. There's the crested top type, celosia cristata. This is, um, you know, there's a number of different um, crested. This is the big, the big ones with the big hump on them. And those are facultative long day plants. So if you grow those under um, long days from the time of sowing, basically you end up with little squat little plants that have got the crown, the coxcomb on top of it. Conversely, if you have the plume type, the Celosia argentia plumosa type, um, that's an obligatory short day plant for initiation. So if you grow that under um, short days from the very beginning, you end up with a short, nicely formed plant that has that nice spike on it. You know, if you take Gregan's breath, that's a plume type of um, celosia, and that's an obligatory short day plant. So I give a nice um, example of what you should do during the different spring production, late spring um, and summer production for both the Cristata and for the Plumosa in the handout. You probably want to revisit um, that, but just keep in mind that if you grow them under this, both a plumosa and a cristata under the same photo period, side by side, you're gonna have completely different responses. One is gonna flower and one's gonna just be big and vegetative, which I think a lot of people have seen when they basically try to grow things like dragon's breath in the um, summer, and they end up with these plants that are three, four feet tall, and they finally flower. Well, guess why? Because the days are finally short enough that they are induced. Whereas on the other hand, you've got a crustata type and you basically, if you grew it under short days, you end up with a little runty little plant. But if you grow it during the um, plug stage under um, short days, they get some size to them and then they initiate very nicely. So hopefully, Bill, we've um, given you a lot of different flavors of um, photo periods and how they can be used. I really encourage people to go and review the um, handouts so that they can get a better idea of how to group their plants, whether it's under long days or short days, or are they just, they don't care, they're just day neutral. No, and, and you, I, I can honestly say that I understood a lot of what you said, and I have sat through sessions on photo period. I have edited many articles and series on photo period, and they tend to be really confusing, so I definitely appreciate you spending this time and meeting with growers in their break room covering this topic that can be very challenging. Um, I, I, I definitely heard uh, some, of the, some of the crops that you mentioned um, having challenges in the past. I've read the, read the emails and the questions from, uh, from folks in the industry. So I know that that's something you guys deal with quite a bit, but that there are good resources that have been researched for many, many years um, to help growers with these. And, and like you mentioned, we do have uh, the wave flowering charts. We have the photo period charts that, that you mentioned, and we will link those in the video description um, for anybody to click on and share with their team. And you can also go back in this video and pause and, and screenshot some of these uh, slides that Will showed. And I think that that'll help give a, a pretty good um, overview of some of the, the crops that, that do have challenges. So really appreciate you taking the time to help demystify this uh this topic that can be quite challenging and uh hopefully growers will uh will, will take some time and, and dig into this a little bit it is one of the most powerful tools in their toolbox to really time accurately so encourage them to give it give it a try definitely definitely so and before we close just another reminder that all the videos from the ball tech on demand in the break room series are collected and posted at growertalks.com slash tech on demand. 
You're, if you look there right now, you're already going to find last week's webinar on vegetative propagation and a quick 30-minute crash course on watering uh, that you can share with your team and hopefully get folks trained up on, on watering best practices with many more to come throughout the month. Next up, we do have another live webinar. This time we're going to talk about seed propagation with uh, Will and Dr. Todd Cabins. Again, so definitely register for that one ASAP at growertalks.com slash webinars. Again, I'll put that link in the description. But that's it for today. And uh, on behalf of Will, I'm Bill Calkins with Ball Tech On Demand, wishing you all the best and nothing else. And hopefully uh, some, some uh, good success with manipulating quota period to grow the best crops you possibly can. Take care out there.